Innate helps companies avoid project surprises, make better informed decisions, share knowledge, and deliver better outcomes. Innate, transforming the way the world builds. Hello, project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always good to have you with us, and I wish we did have Mr. Dale Fung with us, but uh, he partied too hard at the Project Controls Expo in the UK. Uh, but we do have Martin. Martin, how are you, sir? Yeah, good, thanks. And yourself? I hear one of your old projects won an award at the Expo. Mm, Congratulations. It did. it did. Global Innovation of the Year Award, Will, and, and, and Dale, and Martin. And so Dale was actually hosting the awards, which was which is also pretty pretty crazy. Uh, but shout outs to the people behind the scenes. I think uh, Justin Rice, uh, Joel Booker, Magna, Jay, uh, and our clients, uh, Tim, and who was else? Was it Mark and Mark Harrington and Rob Vaughan? Thank you guys. Fantastic outcome. And uh, I'll tell you another story about the uh, digital command center and where it is today. It's pretty funny. Uh, but let's get into our subject today, which is also pretty interesting. Um, Will Woodhead, how are you, sir? Very, very well, thanks. Um, I'm slightly more, slightly healthier than than Dale. So, um, but. Yeah, all good, thanks. That's a pretty low bar, Will. He's pretty yeah. sick all the time. <laughs> but he's missing out. He said he was missing out and he really wanted to be here for it. So we're going to ask some questions on his behalf. Uh, he, he's done a good job over the last couple of days. So look, for you, mate, where did it all start? How did you get into this? Why is it something that you know gets you out of bed in the morning? Um, productivity and workforce planning. I mean, this is a pretty interesting space for me, but you know, what's your reasons? Yeah, uh, good question. So my background is I'm a naval architect. Um, so I um, did a, um, a ship science course in Southampton in, in the UK. And then when I was 21, I was sent to China um, for a, a one year um, sort of job. And this was to work in a shipyard in North China. And this was in 2001. And it was like, well, I go and spend a year in China world and come back and, and, and apply what you've learned. And, and actually what happened is I, I, I jumped from project to project. So fast forward 20 years I was still in Asia and having worked in Singapore, Indonesia, Japan, China, Korea, Thailand, a bit of Norway in there as well. I just I just traveled from project to project um, in heavy mm. industries and oil and gas working from shipyard. It was a sort of major capital project to major capital project. And it, I just got that bug. You do you do that those three year projects um or three three four five-year projects um and it was fascinating I, and i worked in shipyards i worked for the um, samsung in korea in a shipyard i worked for sort of engineering houses american companies i worked for oil companies um, and everything from sort of concept design um through to sort of um commissioning and offshore installation so it was always there was always as a design element to it which was fantastic for an engineer especially sort of with the budgets that we had available but there was always this question of okay we've got to build this thing now and we've got a i don't know 200 500 million couple of billion dollar budget and that means it's um, a lot of people and, and sort of coordinating these people and how do we get the best out of the, the workforce and how do we create the environment that people can work easily with and my most recent role was working for Samsung Heavy Industries and, and I'm not sure if you guys are aware but, but Samsung is the third largest commercial shipbuilder in the world um, number mm -hmm. one and two are um, Hyundai and Daewoo um, so household names um, but they also obviously build um, they're in the heavy industries and and at Samsung, we, we this was a third, so it's not the biggest, but we still had 50,000 people coming in through the gates every day. And setting these people up for a good day's work was incredibly difficult. It was um, it was done on spreadsheets, experience, and a bit of gut instinct. Um, and of course, the Koreans are incredibly successful at commercial shipbuilding, but there was just so much wastage. It was people would wait an hour there, there was a bus system in the yard it, it was so big and you 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 you'd probably spend like maybe 30 minutes some 45 minutes just every day just waiting for buses to get you around mm. um it's like well hang on a second there must be a like technology we must be able to build some technology here to 
understand what's going on um, and help solve this productivity and health and safety issue, or just not, not solve it perhaps, but just improve it. And that's where it really started for me. It was right, um, okay, I've been traveling too long. Children um, are getting older and it's getting way harder to travel with children. So I'm gonna come back to UK, um, set up shop here. I, I heard UK is a pretty good place for startups and build a team. And, and that was three and a half years ago. Excellent. And um, when we talk about, um, I mean, I guess that these are great industries to, to, to I guess, uh, you know, break your teeth on in terms of what they do and how they do it. Cause you've got volume, you've got size, you've got pressures. Um, but when it comes to terminology, productivity is one that uh, we've had debates before. I'm not sure on the podcast, even offline about what pro productivity is and, and how valuable it is too, because again, you know, humans aren't machines. Um, we want machines to be productive, but we, there is a limit to how productive a human can be, I, I think, in terms of um, their ability to adapt to, a, to an efficiency kind of model. Um, and I did a bit of work actually working in manufacturing and, um, you know, on the line. Actually, one of my first jobs was at an abattoir, Will. Right. And uh, if you want to learn about line processing and like speeds of how many sheep you can, you can go through in an abattoir, uh, they had all these kind of calculations. And it was the first place I learned Little's Law you know, and throughput right. and work in progress. And, and uh, so, so productivity is really interesting, but I think for the, for the listeners, what, what is your basic kind of definition when you're explaining it to the layman um, productivity? What is it? So this is the, the, the unit of work done, or the cost per unit of work done. And, uh, and, and so, and the, and the currency we, so the currency I want to use in this example is actually dollars or pounds or, or whatever it is. Sure. Um, and so when, um, and that, that unit of work may be a meter of weld, it may be a square meter of paint, or it may be um, uh, sort of, I guess, carcasses in an abattoir kind of thing. Um, mm. and, but that's, that's, what, that's what matters to the bottom line of, uh, of, for, a, for a project and what have you. And, and, and from that, you can start looking at the, the cost performance and the schedule performance. But you have touched on a really good point, Val, that product, we, we're not machines um there there's some emotion there and and there is a um I don't, I don't think we should talk about it in the same way as we should talk about productivity for a um a sort of an automated line where there's 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 no no humans in there because you do have um so you have the safety element and you have the the pressure the the the, the, the stress the stress side of the 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 worker so there's definitely a balance to be struck um, but at the simplest level, it's a very good measure of how efficient you are um, and whether um, uh, method A of doing something is better than method B. Mm. No, that's great. I, I really agree with you uh, there. And so, you know, when we talk about projects, obviously one of the metrics we always hear about when projects need to improve is around productivity and there's a few other things that they say and i wanted to know if you the difference between the, the three and maybe you've got a, a better way of explaining it than i do um productivity efficiency and effectiveness tend to get used in the same sentences and it's really sometimes it's annoying um sometimes it's because we don't know but sometimes there's some some heat or some value behind it um is there some synergies between the three or are they the same thing what's your uh what's your view of explaining those productivity so i relate productivity to um gdp and and um uh growth of a company because there's there's a, there's a couple of ways you can grow your um uh develop or create economic growth firstly is to bring more people into the country and you have more heads working or you could increase the productivity of the people that you have and that again comes down to sort of unit output per person efficiency is um i think a slightly a, a different take on that because it doesn't necessarily look at the individuals and the work they're doing, but actually looks at sort of more critical path type elements and wastage, mm. um, and um, and and also sort of steps into steps into sort of the ESG side of things, and um, and everybody wants to be as efficient as possible, but I think that there is a subtle difference between productivity. I relate productivity to cost. Um, again, this is not something I'm extremely proud of, but in my oil and gas days, we would make decisions based on loss production, even if they were incredibly wasteful. 
but so 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 let's say for example um uh we would fly somebody around the world just for a small just to carry a single part because that part was is essential to production but that's incredibly wasteful um and, and an mm. inefficient way of doing it but it served the bottom line the best and wasn't necessarily the most efficient way to do it at all um so and and then effectiveness um effectiveness i think it it comes down to the objective that you're trying to achieve i mean i've i've spoken about bottom line profit margin all that kind of stuff but your effectiveness this could be something totally different um like esg for example and uh, carb, um, uh, net zero and all that kind of stuff so I, I think you have to start looking at objectives when you're talking about effectiveness and how what is the best way to achieve um that objective with the greatest efficiency and perhaps the best productivity mm. now that's really good i mean i think you, you're bang on with with regards to productivity as, as an output regardless of what the me- regardless of what the measure is but usually it's cost or, or you know number of widgets or something but you know when it comes to projects um they do tend to look at productivity as a metric and they say right we need to be more productive how, how do you unlock or how do you say more productive in a project when people go well we're already trying to be more productive we come in we don't we don't plan to come into projects and do a bad job do we um what's the what's the approach there um i i, I totally agree it's it's so difficult to say if, if you do, if you're doing the same thing over and over again no change and then somebody asks you to be more productive it's like well I, I can't, it's, I, I'm doing the same thing. So it, it's about thinking differently. It's about uh, looking at the problem with fresh eyes from a different angle, from experiences from another industry. And my sort of background, I mean, I, I worked in sort of heavy industries and sort of traditional project management for 20 years and, and seen all those problems on the shop floor. What I do now is um, we collect data, sort of really granular data about what's happening on the shop floor. And so we're looking at it from a totally different angle and, 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 oh yes, here's, here's an opportunity here and here's an opportunity there. And, and those are sort of the, the opportunities that the data has unlocked for us. Um, and, and it, I think it's this kind of approach that you have to drive, um, in order to find those opportunities, just, um, doing what you've always done, but trying to do it with a bit more finesse is, is not going to open those, those, um, uh, those doors for you. I saw quite an interesting article about your company on a health and safety website. And it, I think the article started with, you probably heard of a project manager describing a successful project saying we completed everything on time on budget and without hurting anyone. And that was about 10 years ago, and success was describing as effectively not killing anyone. Do you think we need to change the way that we approach projects, kind of linking back to what you said there about wastage, efficiency, effectiveness? What do you think we should be talking about in terms of project management or success of projects? Um, Yeah, okay. So one of, probably like two projects ago, we asked ourselves the question, um, how um how can we have a successful project and what does success look like and sort of we it was a town hall meeting or we put it around put it around the project and it was like oh budget schedule blah 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 all this kind of stuff and and i was thinking back to my first project when i was 21 or 22 or so um and it finished in singapore and sorry it finished in 2005 and in 2015 we had a project reunion and there were people coming from um, all over the world to come back together. So this was client and this was subcontractor. And, the, and we had a terrible relationship during the project and it was fighting like cat and dog and all that kind of stuff. But sort of 10 years later, um, we pulled everybody back together and we had a great time. And it was, and then we planned the next five year re- reunion kind of thing. I was like, well, wow, that's that's a community, that's a project. From, from a social perspective, to me, that was success. Um, and to sort of build those relationships and, 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 and continue them on. From a responsibility side of things, especially, especially these mega projects, um, there's, there's all sorts of other factors like, I mean, what I was doing, I was working in various different communities in far flung places in the world and, and actually making sure or ensuring that the local economy would benefit from 
these project was incredibly important. Um, one of the projects I worked on in, in Nigeria, in Lagos, and it was all this technology coming from Korea. The, the final project was actually delivered in, in Nigeria, but there was a huge um, focus on local content and upskilling local people, giving giving um, local people the jobs, because this 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 project was billions of dollars and what have you, and it was being floated in, um, or there was a risk that it would be floated in from another country, and there would be um, no opportunity to learn a new trade, learn a new skill for for any of the locals, and then sort of five years later, it will all be done and dusted, and all the foreigners would disappear. So so this particular project, the, the local content requirements and, and what we put in place were, were, were massive. Um, and it, it really benefited, well, it, it really benefited the local economy. So that's one side. The other side would be the um, the environmental side of things as well. Um, how do you leave the pl this place a better place than when you um, when you when you started? The irony of what I'm saying at the moment is that that I'm talking about oil and gas, but of course I will use that as a bit of sort of bit of license to say that that was a stepping stone and things need to change now but we are using the sort of the the technology that we've developed in that industry in the renewables and in the um uh sort of in the in the, in the hydrogen world also the green hydrogen world nice so i know it's it's quite the debate in the in the project management world about defining success and yeah there's, there's so many different things that you said there um just going back you as someone who's kind of worked in many different places around the world what what do you think the uk or australia in, in val's case can can learn from similar projects in say asia or africa where you've learned in, in terms of working practices culture other um, things that probably we could learn from them and them from us so I, I sort of, um, I'm not writing my CV at the moment, but I think about, I try, people ask me, so I, what should I write in my, put my CV? And it's like, well, take, up, take away all your experiences and write what you're good at. Um, and to me, that was culture, people, because I work with so many different nationalities and, and, and what have you. And this was my, um, the, re the, the, the thing I love about traveling and it's just working in those different environments and, bringing in the perspectives of of different people and I, and I won't I won't I'm not plugging diversity for the sake of plugging diversity and and and, and scoring points but there is a genuine um, value in having that different perspective and that different perspective may not come from somebody with um, a different different race or what have you but from different experiences and different industries and different levels of education um, so, so to me, the culture side of things is is is, is brilliant. Um, on the technical side, actually, Australia is leading a lot of this stuff. The, like the the LNG side of things, the mining, there's a lot of really interesting work going into actually into the green hydrogen and ammonia and the renewables, the geothermal renewables, and the sort of the modular stick build. So all this stuff is being built in the factory in Asia, but and shipped down to down to um, Australia. But um, all of this hydrogen and ammonia is is, is completely renewable. Um, and they're planted to sort of distribute it with a green fleet of ships um, of, of various amounts. So yeah, lots of resources in Australia and the technology is is pretty much there. So it's a really interesting place for the um, for new renewable side of things. Well, didn't know they were so far advanced. You you wouldn't know it from from Val. Um, <laughs> just, just one last one on on culture. Um, you kind of you said you, it's something you're you're quite proud of. You something you're you, you say you're good at. Did you have a, a kind of epiphany moment throughout your career? If you went back to to the start when you were working in Asia, I imagine it's somewhere maybe stereotypically quite focused on productivity and and outputs. Did you have a kind of epiphany moment on culture of being key to success of projects or is it something that kind of evolved throughout your, ex your it, career yeah no it's something I didn't didn't notice until I, I came back to the UK and, and and looked back on my sort of my first half of my career and thought um actually yeah I've I've, I've been successful in a Thai culture and a Chinese culture and a Korean culture um and I'm still friends with all these guys uh and it's um I have a lot of I have I mean I'm I have a lot in common with these people and often more in common with these people than I do with my fellow countrymen. Um, wow. So um, epiphany moment. Um, 
I can't I can't put my finger on it exactly, but I think it was when I was I'm really comfortable going to a new country um, that I'd never been before. Um, sorry, certainly in Asia and Africa. Um, sort of the Americas, I haven't traveled so much. So if somebody dropped me in South America, I would feel a little out of my depth because I don't know the the taboos and what to say or what shouldn't I say. Asian countries, I'm fairly familiar with that. But um, it's probably when I sort of was not worried about being dropped in a country um, and, 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 and told to fend for myself. Yeah, that's great. And um, I thought you were going to say uh, Epiphany and Project Chatter podcast, but that could be later. You never know. Um, sometimes <laughs> there's a delayed response there. Um, and it's good to hear yeah, there is some things. I don't know what uh, you're going to have to explain a little bit more about hydrogen ammonia, because I don't know what that is uh, in terms of of um, um, of context. Okay. Yeah. So there's a company, um, there's a company called um, Fortescue, Fortescue Future Industries that is a subsidiary company of the Fortescue, which is the iron ore company in Australia. And they mm. put billions of dollars, Australian dollars, into this company. And they, so they will they will generate green hydrogen and ammonia from which you can um, use it to power ships. And that is being done through renewable um, solar and geothermic in Australia. Um, wow. So they'll produce this um, hydrogen and ammonia and distribute it worldwide, um, all like green hydrogen, green ammonia. And, and my understanding is that, I mean, transporting hydrogen is a little bit tricky. It's um, uh, obvious because it's slightly lighter, but there's technology in ships. You can convert ships um, to do that. Um, and then and then you can burn it in combustion engines relatively um, simply. So it's, um, it's, sorry, it's not a fossil fuel, but it, is it a fossil? I'm, I'm a little bit out of my depth here, um, <laughs> yeah. but um, it's certainly green. <laughs> And of course, the, wow. the other side of this is, is the blue hydrogen and the gray hydrogen, the gray hydrogen, sorry, being um, just generated from fossil fuels and the blue being, again, we generated from fossil fuels, but we capture the CO2 and we inject it into the ground. Mm. So, so, injecting, so sort of producing hydrogen on the promise that you're going to inject the CO2 into the ground, mm -hmm. bit of a reach, but on paper it works out, but we don't work on paper. No, no, well, watch that space, I guess. It sounds very, very interesting. Mm. Um, look, I know we don't like to push products here, but we do like to hear about products. And I think yours is pretty interesting. And, um, you know, it's it's about this, uh, I guess, this alternative payment method or mechanism, um, which allows tradespeople to get paid for the graft. So for people who work harder, I imagine, is that what we're saying uh, from a productivity perspective? Yeah, so th there's a bit of a, a story as to what what the sort of the initial idea is and where we are at the moment. Um, so we've created a, a wearable device fits on the back of the hard hat with the movement of somebody's head, like a Fitbit, you can understand the activity they're performing. So a Fitbit is, it's okay, but your wrist is not the best place to, to your, your wrist is not indicative. The movement of your wrist is not that indicative of the activity you're doing. Your head is about 10% of your body weight and it's very indicative of, of what you're doing. So even you guys listening now, your heads are pretty stationary. So that lack of movement um, in, uh, implies listening. I'm waving my hands a little bit. And with a, with a splash of machine learning, I can classify this movement as talking. So when you translate that into a construction site, welding, grinding, painting, using any sort of tool, you can start to categorize people day, people's days. Now this set starts to sound a little bit dystopian, a little bit scary, sort of big brother type thing. Mm. And um, so, and, and, and what we wanted, I mean, we're not going to push water uphill. If we're going to create a product like this, we want, and the people who are going to wear it, they need to love it. And they need to genuinely love it, not like, um, okay, I'll wear it because my boss asked me to. So the, the approach is, so, so we started collecting data and, 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 and what have you, and we found that there was the difference between the good guys on this end, this is in a, in a steel fabrication or in a dry lining residential, whatever it is, the, the difference between the good guys and the, and the not so good guys was a factor of four or five. And so, so, sorry, if I could jump in there, how hmm. did you go about getting the guys to buy into that technology? So I imagine people don't like having things that track them all the time that 
mm. they're yeah. not in charge of like a Fitbit. Yeah, yeah. So it was um, um, it was essentially we 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 asked the guys that we, we're collecting data. We're not going to force you to wear this at all, but we're collecting data for this, and we're looking to um, eventually we're looking to start paying bonuses for sort of high performance, and we're looking to solve health and safety and what have you. Some guys went, no, nah, not for me. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll ask about that. So we we got a database together and sort of be able to understand the landscape. Um, and, and sort of what the device does, it sort of it counts the meters of well, the number of screws put in, meters of squared paint and what have you. So you can get a very accurate measure of productivity on an individual level, and then you can aggregate it up. But what we found is that there was a huge difference between the, the the top and the bottom and and when i was sort of project managing i would i would refer to the a team and the, and the c team but actually there was this sort of the d team and the e team and all these guys are getting paid the same money and you're you're getting some people that's playing 20 dollars an hour or 20 pounds an hour and they're outputting four times what somebody else is and they're getting paid exactly the same money um and so why are they doing this this is I mean, they're motivated through pride um, in their own work, I guess, or their sort of respect for their boss and what have you. I mean, the, the guys down the, the, the left-hand side of the curve, they're doing it because they can. So there, there's, there's, there's an argument for the sort of the piece rate side of things, the unit rate. So you get paid per square, square meter of whatever you do. Um, but that's quite contentious because there's always an argument about how much you did, and people will do the easy bits first and the hard bits will come second. So we're thinking like, hang on a second, like construction people, trade people, um, if, if bricks are not getting put on the wall, if weld is not getting put down as quick as you want, no amount of software management training meetings will increase that number. It, it starts with the tradesperson. You've got to you've got to have good conditions for these. You get these people in the right place, and get the bricks on the wall, or get the the weld laid down, and then you can start improving it. So, the money needs to be spent at the bottom end before you can sort of improve the productivity on on the project as a whole. So, so this was like like okay, these guys are so influential on the outcome of a project, and yet they're getting paid a fraction of what the management is. So how can we motivate and incentivize these guys um, to put their best effort into to go the extra mile? Like, okay, well, how about if we use this technology um, and pay people a bonus or pay people sort of on uh, a bonus on top of their salary if they put a heavy, uh, if they put a, um, a sort of a, a long day in. And, and, and putting this sort of um, proposition on the table for the tradespeople, it was like, yeah, I'll have some of that. I like, I started talking to anybody in the street, any any of the construction tradespeople, sort of doing my research. It's like, if you got an extra, if you had an extra ten percent um, um, pay, um, would you wear this device? And do you think you'd work any harder? And they're like, absolutely, yeah, of course, it's ten percent. Are you assuming the sole thing they're motivated by is money, though, or? Is that going to come next? Though, the uh, kind of not, the it's culture, not the so. sole thing, but it is a large portion of it. Um, and I think, I think that's fair for most people. Um, we we did that. We did that that service. Like, well, we can buy. We can do some lunch. We can do coffees. We can. How about time off? Um, and it's like all money. And inevitably, well, not inevitably, but it did come out as um, yeah, money is the most interesting thing for me. And. So, so that's where we are. We're um, we, we're using the technology. It's human activity recognition, but we're put. It's like a Fitbit. So the guys collect their own data. They have control of their data, and they could submit their data into um, a, a data trust where they could earn more money from it, um, and actually start to generate this passive income for tradespeople. How's um? So what's the difference then between progress and productivity? Because Arguably, I could speed up, but I could do that by reducing the quality output. And then arguably, you're not getting really your bang for buck when, you know, he's only painted it once and, yep. you know, yeah. he needed to paint it twice or whatever it is, you know, that, that, uh, that he's doing. Because, you know, when you speed up things, you tend to, 
you tend to cut corners. Um, what's the what's the diversion around non incentivizing corner cutting? Because again, not saying trades people do this, but Australians certainly do. Uh, we're just lazy. Oh, no, we're not lazy. We're um, we're efficient at getting to the point. So I think there could be a case to be said around people just taking advantage of the system. Is that true? So yeah. The- the question that that question we get we get very quickly so so what about safety um if you're working fast what about safety what about quality mm. um what we found is that people don't people work at generally the same rate but the more productive um I say, yeah the more productive people have less downtime so they're walking less and they're stationary for less time so actually when they actually start working they put screws in at the same rate uh, kind of thing so so somebody mm. motivated somebody incentivized um will um, just uh, continue to work at a constant rate um, and, and, and they'll, they'll, they won't go for those walks or they won't have that, that stationary period of time. So that's one side of it. And, and that's a theory we haven't proved um, completely yet. But the other side to it is like, well, this is not a magic, magic bullet. We, you still need supervision. You still need to make sure that the, the, the technical spec is being adhered to. Um, this is this is another piece of information that you can use to um, uh, reward not necessarily all your good guys, but people who are going the extra mile. And that could be the apprentice who is just started, or it could be the experienced hand, mm. or it could be somebody who is sort of a few years away from retirement, but they've just put in an extra ten percent. Is it? Um, and, and the other thing I was going to say, what about the intangibles? For example, um, you know, culture and dynamics. I mean. There's usually there's someone that's got a, a big personality, probably they're not the most productive on site, but you know he's the guy that keeps everyone together at you know Smoko, that's, that stops the kids you know having an argument, um, that takes the boys out for beers after the, after a big shift, that kind of intangible measure is that something as well that's been factored into this? Yeah, so it's 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 a really interesting one, um, sort of team performance, and mm. we can slice and dice the data any way you want, um, and create a metric that looks after individuals, looks after teams, looks after different people on that curve. Um, we, what we try and promote is that team cohesion, sort of, you, there's a whole load of money here that you can, you, can, you can earn yourself and it's up to you to work together to get everybody across that line. Um, I don't have all the answers to that. <laughs> Like, is one person work one person who works on their on their own times a hundred better than a hundred people working together as a team? Um, but there is a lot of camaraderie um, sort of in in construction, and it is highly likely it's far more valuable than a lot of people get it give it credit for. Would you try and yeah, have team team based incentives or you know gang based incentives as well as the individual ones that? Exactly. Exactly. That, that, yeah. Yeah. That's what we do. We actually put a third uh, on on one of our jobs. We've got um, a third on teams and two thirds on their individual. Oh wow! And is that something that changed through time? So when you first rolled it out, I'm guessing it was more individual based. And what what was the kind of learning as and the evolution of the um, of the technology? It was. I mean, this particular project is in, is a dry line at the end, and we we see people working much better together in teams. So um, on that, we didn't want people to go off and do their own separate things and and um, not help their colleague or teammate and what have you. So there was, we wanted a responsibility on on everybody to sort of to pull together and not take all the material themselves and leave their leave their teammate scuppered. Um, so it's. It's sort of turned into, it's not turning, it is turning into this um, behavioral science type project because we, we can start to understand with objective data what people are motivated, how people perform with different incentives. Um, and I mean, we, 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 we're a technology company that we have sort of hardware embedded firmware cloud services, machine learning, and any and, and operational capabilities of operation improvement and construction. And then at the end of it is behavioral science, which again, I'm well out of my depth on, on this, but learning fairly quickly. Um, but it, but essentially it, it always comes back down to the guys on the floor. It's like, okay, what is going to make your day better? Is it shorter days, more money? Um, how, where does health, health and safety fit into that? 
um, it's it, it, it's all of that. Yeah, all of the above. More pay, shorter days. <laughs> I'm with you. More beer. <laughs> um, what about uh, the distribution profile for for performance or productivity? Uh, when it comes to age, is this, is this being a little bit ages? Cause I know, I, I know certainly for myself, I'm a lot slower than I used to be just mm. because of the nature of work I, I do sometimes in training, but I can imagine that, you know, you know, 60 year old Bob isn't going to be as fast or productive as uh, a 20 year old Martin. Mm. What's the, what's the way to kind of curve that challenge? Yeah, really, really interesting. We certainly, we, we certainly don't want to discriminate, but so there's no but. Um, how far we, we run? We, we're fairly used to live in a meritocracy um, where good sort of the, the the better performers get get more money, and that's a principle we hold throughout, um, apart from a sort of a real left wing socialist. Um, so we do need to come up with a system where everybody has the opportunity to earn extra cash, whether they are. Again, they're 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 slower. They they they're a few years away from retirement, or they are um, less experienced. And there's a balance to be struck because if you if you start paying that apprentice with six months experience more than the senior hand, um, then there's going to be a bit of a, a pushback. Um, but but rightly so, we we still want to motivate that individual, and and, and we still want to motivate everybody up the curve. Um, and so those. Um, and, and how we can do that is based on personal performance. So we can measure the individual against his own personal performance and, and have a 10% improvement and say, great, there you go. There's a, there's a bunch of cash or here's a sort of free dinners or, or Amazon vouchers or, or, or anything like that. So it is a really interesting problem um, that we have to get right um, because yeah. there is a job for everybody, even the people that are just right down the bottom chances are the problem is not them it's actually the job they're doing has the data that you've gathered over the years has it broadly been in line with what you expected so let's say people are primarily motivated by pay has there been anything that you weren't particularly expecting that the data is coming out with uh mm. <laughs> uh let me think a, a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm not going to answer that question directly, but a lot of the stuff is, yes, we suspected that was the case. Here's the magnitude, and and a lot of people come to us and say, oh, I already knew that. Like Monday mornings are way less productive than Wednesday mornings, but what we're saying is, oh, they're eleven percent less productive. So that means you can have a meeting or you can have a training session on Monday mornings, and as long as it doesn't go over thirty-seven minutes, you're good. Kind of thing. So you, you you then have the information that you can sort of take an action on. Um, was there anything that I didn't expect? Um, I don't think. Um, sorry. Yes, there is. The, the, it, it comes down to this motivation. It's um, how much do people have left in the tank? So a, a workforce is working at a particular rate and um, if you give them an opportunity, if you incentivize them with anything, if it's a stick or it's a carrot, how much will they improve their performance with that incentivization? And I, 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 I was thinking, I don't know. I, did, I, I really hadn't a clue, but I, 5%, 10%, a little bit. What we actually saw was a 30% improvement in um, output so 30% more well put down 30% more screws put in just with an, an opportunity to earn up to sort of 15% um, extra money so and, and sorry and so we saw that in the data and I've also seen that I won't say in real life but in traditional type um, uh, construction in, in in sort of back in my Samsung days where it's very very strong culture and uh, sorry I'd have to go a little bit back into the, so the Korean culture. So after the Korean War, um, sort of devastation to the country and the, the economy was in tatters and all the men were, were fighting in the Korean War. They said, right, OK, now you have to fight for your country and put your lives into the industry and rebuild the company. So there's a very, very 
um, loyal workforce in Korea today. And people, I mean, it's starting to change now with the sort of millennials, but people are so dedicated. It's company first, you second, family third. Um, and the motivation, so we had a project and we were late and, and what have you. And a directive came down from the um, CEO saying, right, this vessel is going to leave in six weeks time. And anybody who hasn't got their job finished and stops it sailing away, there's going to be trouble. And it was just um, heaven and earth just moved. It was, dull. I, I don't know what the figure was, but um, we actually, the six weeks, sort of the six week was so unrealistic. Um, it, it still, so we didn't actually hit that six weeks. I think we delivered like 10 weeks or something like that. But had that sort of motivation, I mean, that was the stick there. Had that motivation not been there, um, then it would have been sort of another 20, 20 weeks out kind of thing. So, so yes, I've mm. seen that step change in from motivation and incentivization, but that obviously was a negative stick being used rather than the, the, the positive end. Is there the work like that as well? Uh, we've all been in projects where they're behind and there's always someone... Um, in leadership, or let's not call it leadership, in management, who's ready to use the stick um, quite liberally, and um, you know, paint everyone with the same same brush in the sense that, right, guys, we're in this together. We're late. Go figure it out. And what you do get out of that, you do get a, what I would say, is a spike in productivity because because everyone's got a common vision and a purpose, and and that can get you to the finish line. Um, but it's it's what I worry about is the humanizing part of this is what happens after that because. Um, just personally, I, I know a lot of people who um, have put career first and they've burnt out um, or they've committed suicide or they've got some horrible disease because they've just not taken care of their own health. They haven't put themselves first. They've had divorces. Um, what is the backlash or what is the byproduct of too much productivity, if you understand what I'm saying? Um, I think the answer or part of that answer lies in the financial industry um, because it's an industry which is so motivated by metrics because the metrics are there. You yeah. don't need technology for that. It's just front and center. And I think, I think you see that in the burnout. It's like, have you hit your, it's not your quarterly, it's your monthly or your, or your fortnightly targets. And, and, and of course the, the financial industry is rife with burnout and, um, uh, and, and those kind of problems. So absolutely. If, if we get this, like when you get it wrong, so not if it gets wrong, when it goes wrong, it looks like that. Um, and, and, and that's what we need to avoid. Um, mm. the, the carrot and the stick thing, I've, I've seen it like technology aside again. I've, I, my, my personal management approach is a lot of carrot and a little bit of stick at the end. And, and as you say, Val, it's, it's sort of we're in this together. It's, it's a stick on all of us kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I, I, my sort of theory on that is, well, with a carrot, you get, you gain respect. It's not always sort of carrot, carrot, but um, sort of um, integrity and respect, you can gain that. And when the stick needs to come down, it's, it's on everybody and, and, and you understand the consequence. It's not just stick for the sake of being stick kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we do still have it's changing quite like, like that traditional stick approach is changing certainly in the uk um, we i speak to a lot of sort of the older generation more traditional construction people and it's stick through and through um, yeah that has to be and and they're used to it as well i think there's some some level of understanding it's it's kind of uh, part of the culture previously yes the younger generations now doesn't work it mm. it, it, it really um it's respect and sort of equal footing and um, bright side rather than you're going to lose this job. So on that point, then, um, you know, there is a big talk about gender equality and uh, look, I'm not going to go down the political sphere here, but I do think that that would be a question is productivity. Uh, if you have a mixed workforce, particularly in the trade space, um, productivity would be different, particularly if you need to use, your biological advantages, for example, men are stronger than women. Mm. And that's a clear statement. Mm. And uh, so if they're, if they're laying bricks, they're going to be laying bricks at different rates. Are we saying that we're going to keep a baseline KPI, let's say a baseline productivity rate by the individuals, therefore 
if they improve their individual productivity, fine. Or are we saying we're going to have a benchmark productivity rate? And if you exceed that, then you get a bonus or some type of carrot. What's, what's the mechanism for that? I think, it, I think it's a mixture of both. Um, sorry, coming back to the, the gender side and, and the, uh, I, I would mix, I, I, would, I would strip out gender and say, right, here's a bunch of people um, and they all have different capabilities. Mm. This particular role is, um, requires this kind of capability and you have to be, it, it helps if you're over six foot and you've got arms like my legs type thing. Um, if you don't have that kind of physiology, then these are the roles for you um, and you can go and be successful over there. Um, I don't think you have to start talking about gender on that because even on sort of both sides of that, like in the male and female side of things, there are people who are good at it and people are not through physiological differences. Um, but yes, there is a, um, certain people are motivated by improving themselves and other people are motivated by competing with their peers. So if you have a benchmark, somebody wants to be at the top and that's fine. So, and, and whilst other people, it's just that, that sort of, that self-competition and, and, and what have you. So it, it's always a mixture of both. And, and again, if you, if you just reward the benchmark people and these high performers, then you're missing out on all this opportunity. I can't, like the top guy, I can't double his productivity. Impossible. He's already, already smashing it. But the bottom guy, I can double his. So does the, the high performer, high potential, who's already at the peak of his cap or productivity, does he just just get not a bonus, but it's just part of his salary because he's already doing the best he can? No, no, he gets a bonus and he gets the highest bonus. Um, but okay. that is a insurance policy because you don't want mm. to, when, when, when he leaves or when he, when he doesn't come into work, the top guy in the, in the company needs to pick up the phone to him and go, what's wrong? Can I help you? Why are you leaving? Mm. Um, th these guys are sort of the most important, but I can't improve. I can't improve them. They're already good. They're already amazing. Um, yeah. So, and, and, and the bottom guys, we get a lot of customers that say, who are these bottom guys? I want to know. I want them out of here. I like, no, 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 you've, you've missed, missed the point. Like if mm. you hire a bunch of people, you will always get those bottom guys. So you're going to have to learn to live with it. The, the exciting thing for you is that you can halve their costs. If you motivate them, or if you get them in the right place, you can move them up a little bit. And, and the, the increase in productivity you can get from these guys is outstanding. And yeah. they can get more money in their pockets. They're happy. You're happy. Well, hey, that makes sense to me. I think, it, you know, the analogy is probably more like, you know, athletes, you know, where you have... Uh, the star athletes, you know, they make probably the the largest proportion of of money because people come to see them and they're phenomenal at the peak of their their game. But then you have other people in the team, you know, if it's a team sport, and they're all important, um, and they can be motivated, I guess, to to become a a, a prime athlete. But they don't have to be because they're playing a role that's still important. And I get that bit. <clears throat> that makes sense to me. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Without turning it into a sales pitch for your company, how does what you're doing compare to, let's say, some high-profile high companies in the UK who use productivity measures? How does it compare, and, and what are they doing differently to you and, and you to them? And, and are you generally getting the same kind of results? Um, so, I, so I sort of draw similarities between what we're doing. So... so sports industry the, the 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 wearable technology in sports it's your garmin watch your fitbit your strava all that stuff it's a it's a source of information that motivates you to go and get on your bike and the cost of that is 199 dollars or whatever it is to buy it your subscription and then the sweat you have to put in to to, to do that exercise with a a vague promise that your bathroom scales may look more favorably on you or whatever it is you, you may you may fit your lycra better um and and that's a huge industry that's driven off this sort of motivating people to get fit and and, and what have you what we're looking at is this mo um this human behavior and motivating individuals i mean yes it's done traditionally with contracts i'll pay you more money if you do this job type of thing but that's sort of on a contract basis if you can start to 
reward people and measure people on a sort of a, a much shorter period and reward them much quicker, then the whole motivation of human performance can be brought into any activity or, or manual job um, where where sort of the, the, the manual work is is is, is, um, is, is needed. So I, I think it's a really exciting space um, because the op the opportunity is huge. Um, getting the messaging right, it's a, it's really controversial or could be controversial um, because we, we we've spoken about the productivity and and what's the negative side of all of this stuff. We have to be really really careful of. Um, but this that you 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 meet a lot. I've met a lot of people that love the piece rate stuff. The um, Oh, my like my salary is uncapped. It's it's like I earn ten percent of whatever I sell. Um, the, the the recruitment industry is brilliant. The sales market is is brilliant. These guys are so motivated, often a little too too much, to to sell their product because their income is tied to their directly tied to their performance. Mm. Does it have to be just cost or or sorry salary? Sometimes I think um, the other motivator would be time. You know, if you said. Uh, and this is getting pretty pretty strange already. But if you think about like, well, my bonus I want in terms of like we know what time in lieu is, right? Mm. Where well, you did a few hours for Jeff, he, you know, your manager held you back. He says, but you know, have a few hours off next week. Mm. Um, I think that could be advantageous because there is some merit to the idea of a four day work week, which is being tested around the world. And uh, I'm curious about that too, whether that's actually going to drive up productivity, um, maybe avoid some of the pitfalls of being um a star where you are, are working harder you know where you know maybe it is a mix of of cost and time that is the incentive would that work as well um yes i think i, I think it is i mean a lot of the work we do people are on hourly rates so if you gave, give people extra money then they can afford to take time off um but invariably they don't do that because certainly in the uk a lot of our construction workforce is imported it's it's european um and people come to the uk because of the higher salaries so any opportunity they have to work they'll take it because they send their money home um mm. it's kind of like me when i was working overseas i did it <laughs> a lot of it was for the money um so there is certainly a balance to be struck and, and actually so that's a really this is a great segue thanks well um <laughs> we did a study on shift patterns so we had one um, group of guys, it was 30 guys or so, and they had they only had half an hour, they were doing nine hour, nine and a half hour days, and they had a half an hour break at, sorry, um, I'll get this right. Yeah, they did a half an hour break between 12 and 12.30, and they'd be back on the tools. Um, and then we introduced two breaks, two half an hour breaks, one at 10 o'clock and one at two o'clock. Um, so the two break system was nine hour day and the one break system was nine and a half hour day. The guys with the two breaks um, put slightly more screws in the wall in nine hours than the same people did in nine and a half hours. Mm. So it was, it was, it was, it was less is more. It was, and, and, and you saw it in the fatigue curve. So we've got, we've got fatigue curves for, for, for different types of work and what have you. And you get past seven hours, six hours, about six hours, and productivity or output drops very, very quickly. So if you're putting a 12 hour day in, it's your last four hours are horrendous type thing. You don't want to, so things like overtime, like never do overtime during the week because you're operating at about 60% um, efficiency. If you want to do overtime, you do it on Saturday mornings. So um, that's a good tip. Sorry, and, and that's if you want to control cost. If you want to, if you want to boost your schedule, then yeah, fill your boots. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. So and and so what we're looking at now is um, how do we get that optimum shift pattern? How do we make it get um, work smart, not uh, not hard? Um, and and so to, to control cost and, and and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, mm. re yeah, very, re very relevant, especially when you think about health and safety, because slip strips and falls incidences tend to um, the frequency occurs as the shift progresses. So they, they tend to happen in the late in the afternoon or the late shift or in the in the, in the evening. Mm. 
Does that mean as well with uh, people who have like injuries um, and they come back to work? Let's say they're, they're productive, but then they have an injury, like pull their shoulder out or something. And I'm just using the bricklayer because that was the one we started with as an example. Their productivity again is going to go back down. So they miss out on the incentive. Is that right? Um, they, they, they would if we don't know about it. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. It does it does have this, you know, and I guess you get a lot of these questions, Will, because it is new and it's and it's novel and you're you're fixing something from I guess an, another industry, right? As you said, we track people all over the place. We track people on the streets, we track ourselves, our phones track us. Um we we're kind of moving into this I'd say the Orwellian dystopian to 1984, but we're doing it voluntarily. Uh and I guess this could be used for good and bad. Um, is there any situation where this could be a security problem? Um, I'm, I'm sure. So, yeah, so the data is <clears throat> is so rich. Yeah, so we're, we're talking to MOD defense um, people. And mm. so what we, so the, the policy we have as a company is, um, right, you as an individual, this is your data. Sorry, back up. Um, nobody owns the data people own a license to use the data and view the data in certain ways. And there are certain expectations that, uh, that are set um, that protects individuals' privacy, um, p- uh, companies' IP, um, and what have you. So we as a policy, so, so individuals can have access to their data. They can use it as a digital CV. They can use it to de- demonstrate their capability for their next job. They can't resell it, for example um we can we can aggregate the data so if we wanted to look at bricklaying in the south of england during the summer we could aggregate that data all up and and we can issue a report to the government to say right your your house building um projects for bricklaying is productivity is climbing is dipping covid had is this impact christmas is that impact um kind of thing so because the data is so rich i don't want one company to sit on that and and not be able to extract the value out of it so the policy is that that we want to be able to get these into the hands of people that can actually um drive value of course the question does come well what about my ip what about security so you're working with a defense project oh that's a that's a a, um that's very sensitive work there we we don't want that so there are examples where this would have to be so a, a different model would have to be broken down um mm. as far as individual security um is concerned um we have very strict i mean it's all anonymous anything we, we give the data yeah. to the individual everything else is completely anonymous but we go we go further it's um it's it's ag- it's aggregated up to a minimum level so you could never actually, even if it was anonymous data, you can never see individual data from one person. Um, you would see sort of average yeah. minute, uh, average shift length, or something, something like this. Um, but, but it can't, it can't be completely anonymized if you're going to pay people bonuses, right? It yeah, how, have how do you know the lowest the, performers? Um, yeah. So we can't. Well, okay. So the the, the perform- code, yeah. The performance data is is anonymized. Um, but then we send every month or every payroll, we send right a list of names and this is how much you should pay them. So you can't make a, tar- a connection between this table and that performance data. And somebody oh, might okay. say, well, well, actually, you've paid this guy the most. He must be the top performer. And you've paid this guy the least. He's the bottom performer. But that's not entirely true because we look at sort of percentage increases and team performance and and so you start to lose the um sort of the detail in it i can imagine let's assume this gets taken worldwide which i'm sure would be fantastic will for you and uh you know everyone's using it and there's benefits across the board in the construction space particularly in the trades disciplines right could you see a world in the future um where this is actually an exclusive right like a social credit system where part of your as you said digital cv is your productivity score and they'll be like right you know it's kind of like uh yeah okay you worked here you worked there oh your productivity was four can you explain that to me instead of a instead of an eight um could that be a way of excluding people in in the screening process of an interview um yes that could be a way um i i think we would 
you, you'd only want to use it. So as I said, the, the, the benefit of this starts with the tradesperson. So right, here's all your data and here's a report that, that we've automatically generated or you've generated yourself that shows your best qualities. Like like your like like I write CVs. I don't like that job I got fired from. I don't include that in my CV or <laughs> anything like that. So I I, I want to present the best the best side of myself. And and we, the principle is um, we must maintain. Sorry, that we must maintain that principle at all times at all costs. That the this is a piece of technology for tradies to demonstrate their value. Yeah, I think the other thing I was going to say is, is how does it work from a, because, you know, you incentivize these people, they get more pay. Uh, I, I've certainly been in situations where we've increased the salary of some staff for, for great performance, and we've actually put them in a higher tax threshold bracket, and it's ended up being a bit of a pain for them in, in the return, and they didn't really get much back. Yeah. How does, how does the bonus scheme work from a, from a tax? I mean, it's different in different countries, obviously, but from a UK perspective, how, how would you um, navigate that? So the yeah so the, the the tax bracket at the moment or the the one in question is a 50k tax bracket. So um and and the rate so the salaries for the guys that we work with are sort of 35 to 40. So there is there mm. is a chance that they it could sort of touch into that. Um. But it's um that that uh, so I'm not familiar with the tax system in in Australia, but I'm sure it's not. Um, That's I'm similar. Sure it's stepped. Yeah. Um, so you're never going to actually get less money. Um, you you might start paying more tax, but you won't actually get less money in your pocket because you only yeah, pay tax on the money that's over and above. Yeah, and I, it probably hits the probably higher end extremities more than it does the lower end. But um, yeah. no, that's really really interesting. Uh, look, we we are heading to the end of the pod, Will, uh, but we do have one special feature. A machine gun man will get us into. It's a pop quiz. Um, if you've got time and and you're willing, are you ready? Uh, fire away. <laughs> Over to you, Martin. Okay, thanks for the intro, Val. Question one, what's your one piece of advice for people new to the construction profession? One piece of advice, um, pretend pretend as if you don't know anything. Arrogance is not something that goes down well in the construction industry. <laughs> yeah, but uh, number two, what's the biggest misconception about productivity? Um, everybody everybody is capable of um, high productivity. It depends on the job that they have to do. Are good leaders born or made? Um, made. I think it's experiences, life experiences that shape you. What would be your book recommendation to our listeners? Um, Matthew Saeed, Black Box Thinking. Ah, great book, good job. Um, finally, if you had your time again, would you go straight into oil and gas or something completely different? I'd be a fighter pilot. Nice. <laughs> My eyes are good. So that's the, I think that's an awesome career. That explains the moustache. Did you see <laughs> Top Gun 2? I've got a leather jacket as well. Ah, oh, stop. <laughs> that's it. That is awesome. Well, look, uh, Willis, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you, you know, we went all over the place. We, we, uh, we asked some pretty curvy questions, but it's a very interesting technology that you and your uh, company uh, putting forward but any final uh thoughts from yourself for our listeners um no this is this is about uh, martin you you've really challenged me that's been really interesting conversation made me think about it in a, in a different light um i i think we are we are pushing boundaries but what we've uncovered um i think is really exciting um and and, and i've said it before but the, our, we, we are building stuff we want to build stuff to make trades people's lives better they they've had this shitty end of the stick for a long time um and i and i'm the one with soft, hands, soft management hands so um <laughs> it's it, it's an exciting place to be especially when you look at the, the opportunities yeah i agree uh, everybody watch this space uh, martin any final thoughts for you no i echo what will said there it's such an interesting concept and technology and it's, it's ever evolving and it's interesting to see how some of the softer things apply to some of the more harder productivity and how about yourself any any thoughts from you i'm not sure yet i think i have to listen back to will uh but it was great i mean at the start i think we all start apprehensive when we talk about new tech but by the end of it i think having long long conversations is, a, is an important point especially in discourse i think i would advise people listening you know even if you don't agree with someone's point of view you know give them time uh have a long conversation a cup of tea 
something like that uh, and sit back and listen to this pod. But uh, folks, that's all we have time for tonight or today or this morning, wherever you're hearing us from. If you like what you heard, you can pay it forward by sharing a link to this episode on your social media. A massive thank you to Will Woodhead and Martin, of course. Uh, and thank you for all listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me and Martin, it's bye for now.